it thou wilt, show me the whole of the law. All right, welcome back to part two of today's talks. Before I plunge in, however, I've been asked by my gracious host um, to mention that following this talk, we'll have some snacks and wine and the like, and uh, you can all uh, ask me questions while I'm drunk, which <laughs> some, sometimes produces different answers. Um, and then tomorrow, at the normal uh, mass time here at Blazing Star, we'll be having a very special event, a deacon ordination preceding the mass. Yay! Thank you! Yay! Who could it be? I <laughs> I'm certainly not going to out them. Um, <laughs> but if that person, person wanted, does. if that person wanted to stand up or something, <laughs> yeah. I've seen right. them before. Right. <laughs> so um, please, if you can, make it to one or both of those. And with that, as much action as word, the nature of magical ritual. Liber Libre is, in my view, the single most useful manual for the practicing magician. If I, if I had to send a magician off to a desert island with but one book mm. to draw from, that would be the one. It is incredibly compact. It covers just about everything you need to know about how to avoid going off the rails, being the book of the balance. Mm -hmm. It's uh, verses 12 and 13. I find especially useful and interesting in this regard. Remember that unbalanced force is evil, that unbalanced severity is but cruelty and oppression, but also that unbalanced mercy is but weakness which would allow and abet evil. Act passionately. Think rationally. Be thyself. Mm -hmm. That's so easy. <laughs> and then it goes on in verse 13. True ritual is as much action as word. It is will. The interesting thing to me, which it took me a, a, an embarrassing number of years for it to suddenly drop into my consciousness, is that those two verses are structurally connected to one another. So we are told, act passionately, Think rationally, be thyself. Immediately followed by, true ritual is as much action as word, it is will. Act passionately, think pa rationally, be thyself. Action, word, will. They are the same triangle repeated in two different forms. And together they form the key to magical practice. Or at least so I hope to convince you in the course of today's talk. <laughs> I asked before, but once again, a show of hands, who here does some form of ritual magical practice? All right, so nearly everybody it looks like. Good. So I'll, I'll, I'll stay off the if you thing and just assume magical practice is going on. So, if you're all doing magic, can someone please give me Crowley's definition of magic from magic and theory and practice? Absolutely. So this, uh, Crowley could go on at great length, but when he was terse, he was beautifully terse. Mm -hmm. This is the most compact and beautiful definition in the entire Crowley corpus, in my view. The art and science. So it's neither in isolation. It is neither as well-defined, cut-and-dried, predictable, delimited as a science, but nor is it as free-form, abstract, purely creative as an art. It is an art and a science. It is combining the two. In this sense, I like to compare it to something like architecture, where it is an art. A great architect creates beauty, but they do it within the constraints of both the walls got to bear the load, and the ceilings have to be properly supported. There, there are constraints. There's science mixed in with the art. And I think there's a reason that masonry is built on that same set of metaphors. So, the art and science of causing change in conformity with will. When I first read this definition, I was in college. I got a, a hold of a second-hand copy of the old black, white, and red print of the Dover edition of Magic and Varian Practice. Yay. Yeah, I know. And uh, read it. Read it actually read the first maybe 50 pages of it and just threw it away. I actually <laughs> gave it to a kid down the hall. I often wonder what happened to that copy, because I thought it was absurd. I thought it was just, it was just ludicrous. If, if 
art and if, if magic is the art and science of causing change in conformity with will, I mean, well, everything we do causes change. And I, I kind of like well, in conformity with will, whatever. Um, <laughs> but if, if magic is just all change, then that means that making breakfast is magic, or you know, <laughs> picking up a book is magic. That, that's crazy on the face of it. And like parts of all many years I, later, I came back to the Grail Castle, and suddenly it all made a great deal more sense. <laughs> um, <laughs> The art and science of causing change in conformity with will. It's that last clause that gives it its force, that makes it actually mean something. Because yes, by the very act of existing, we are causing change. Just sitting there, you are constantly changing oxygen into carbon dioxide. You are metabolizing the food in your stomach. So you're going to go out and you know people are going to avoid you on the sidewalk. The, the very existence of a physical body with needs in this manifest world means that you are going to be an agent of change so long as you exist. It is, it is unavoidable. Magic is the art and science of causing change in accordance with will. And that, of course, brings us to the grand question of what is will. And what I misunderstood when I was in, in college is it doesn't mean want. Will is purpose. Will is our personal teleology, to use a term that I introduced in the earlier talk, our personal meaning or goal, the framework in which we have some set of purposes, goals, ideas to accomplish in our lives, and an action taken under will is one that furthers those goals. So today, for example, each of you, if I can assume for a moment that it was part of your will to attend this class, that you didn't do it through mistake or compulsion, um, that, that this was somehow furthering your ends, you were faced with a challenge that you could not attend the class if you were in your living room. That you had to somehow find a way to make your way here to the Bay Area Atlantic Temple through some number of miles of travel. You then applied a formula to the end of causing that change to occur. You found your, your BART token. You put gas in the car. You called and asked for a ride. You did whatever formula. And there's a thousand different ways that you might have done this. But each of you found and applied successfully a formula of transportation, which caused the change in your location to occur at the proper time so that you were able to fulfill this aspect of your will. That was magic. Absolutely pure magic by Crowley's definition. It is my assertion that the single greatest mistake that a magician can possibly make is to forget that making your way to class or making yourself breakfast or doing your job well enough to support yourself and provide stability in your life is as profoundly magical as anything that you ever might do while wearing a funny robe and yelling at the walls in dead languages. <laughs> That's, they, there is a terrible, terrible tendency to put magic in a box, to say magic is what I do at the lodge, at the oasis. Magic is what I do when I'm you know, holding my wand, when I have my grimoire open. Magic is this thing that is separated. I keep it in its own little category, and the rest of the time I'm not doing magic. That's the death of magic. Magic is not a, a hobby if done, if done practically, if done right, if done in a way that's going to make anything happen. It's a lifestyle. Magic is happening in every moment. Every, every willed decision is a magical act. And our goal should be to make every decision we make a decision under will. That's why... It is so important to keep going back to the advice in Libre, which is act passionately, think rationally, be thyself, because that is the recipe for keeping yourself in that state in which you are capable of making <coughs> willed decisions. So given that all that's true, if you're with me so far, if you'll accept the premise that every act whatsoever that is undertaken under will, that is undertaken with intention, and with the end of furthering your will, as you understand it at a given moment, is a magical act, well then, why do we put on funny robes and yell at the walls in dead languages? What is the purpose of explicit, formal, hermetic ritual magic? Of this, this, this very tiny, I, I would argue on the great Venn diagram of, of magic, 
if, if magic is a circle this big, formal hermetic magic is a circle so small that it looks like a dot. It, it encompasses a tiny fraction. How much time do any of us spend doing the Gnostic Mass or performing initiations or even doing rituals in our homes compared to the amount of time we spend driving to work or making lunch? It, it vanishes into invisibility. But nonetheless, that doesn't mean it's not important. So why would we want to do this, this tiny fragment of a speck that is formal hermetic magic. My first magical teacher memorably explained this to us. And I, he had a, a wonderful class, um, the very first class I took from the OTO, which was titled Magic in Theory and Practice and Practice and Practice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, exactly. Um, and. His explanation for it was in terms of a two-phase model of how technical magic proceeds. And these two phases go by the technical names Rumpty Dump and Poof. <laughs> Rumpty Dump is all of the, the paraphernalia and the chanting and the waving sticks at walls and all of the things that happen in the room, the visible aspects of it, memorizing the ritual, performing the ritual, getting your friends to help you with it, whatever it might be. It is the production aspect of it. Poof is the moment when in an elevated state of consciousness, in a state of focused intention, your will and the universal will become identical. And at that point, how can your will fail to become manifest? It is the universal will. Rumpty Dump is a way to get yourself to poof. <laughs> and over time, many magicians find that they have they, they, they know the way to poof well enough that they can drop the amount of rumpty dump. <laughs> Once you know your way to poof, you can do it much easier. If your style of rumpty dump is not poofing, find new rumpty dump. <laughs> Unless you're just into that, you know. <laughs> Some people like waving sticks at walls and yelling in dead, dead languages. And if so, whatever floats your boat. But if you're after change, if you're after change in accord with will, find the technology, find the mechanisms through experimentation, the method of science, as Crowley said. Find the rumpty dump, find the, the production, the, the exterior aspects of ritual, which lead to poof, which get you to that point of ecstasy, which is a really interesting word. Pete Carroll uses it as his term for the state in which magic happens, and I really like it because of its etymology. Ecstasy means removal from stasis. And ecstasy is anything that gets you out of your ordinary state of, of consciousness in any direction. And an ecstasy that is well planned, that is crafted through poop, will put you in the right direction out of normal consciousness to the get you to the end desired. So if you take nothing else away from this talk, it is find the Rumpty Dump that works for you. Do not rest until you're achieving poof. And you can quote me on that. <laughs> <laughs> so certainly, we do ritual to get to poof. That's one reason that you might want to. But there's some other good reasons for doing ritual. One of them is that it is a proven psychological technology. Humans have used ritual for purposes of bonding, of focusing themselves, preparing themselves for various events, commemorating various events, since the Neolithic. It's, it's one of the things that makes us human, is that we, we ritualize, we, we attempt to commemorate or prepare. If you, you can see on the, the cave paintings at places like Lascaux, the clear evidence of rituals done before hunts in order to make the, the hunt more effective or after hunts to thank the stag god for giving of his bounty. It has been going on a long time and it has psychologically powerful effects. There, there is a very real sense in which fake it until you make it works psychologically. If you are a hunter and you believe that the hunting ritual that you are doing will make you more effective, you will be more effective. It's measurable. If, if anything that makes you, they, they've done tests that show if you, if you give someone a test on their ability in some skill area, and then you tell them, no matter how they scored on it, you tell them either they did worse than they really did or they did better than they really did, 
on the next similar test, they'll do worse or better, depending on which one you said they were. It's, it's incredibly powerful. That's what Ritual's plugging into. It's, it's as, it can be as simple as if you think your lucky rabbit foot makes you lucky, you'll be more tuned in to opportunities that come your way because you're expecting to be lucky. You'll be more tuned in on the universe handing you opportunities. So this proven psychological technique, a lot of people denigrate the sort of psychologization of magic, you know, reducing it to psychology. I don't do that. I think real poof is out there. But don't downplay the purely psychological benefits because they're they are there as well. On a slightly more woo level, <laughs> ritual plugs into a sort of momentum of the collective soul, the egregore. There's, I, I try in my talks to stay away from a lot of explicit woo because everybody approaches that differently and I don't want to impose on anyone, but I think it, in my own experience at least, it seems to me to be plausible and in, in, in my practice true that every ritual has a place, a temple corresponding to it on the astral. And in some sense, everyone who's ever practiced that ritual has been in that temple at the same time. You know, there's no time on the astral. So all Gnostic masses are going on simultaneously in the astral mass temple. And by plugging into that, you're plugging into the energy of all that stored momentum. All that, when you, when you, when you tune your radio in on the Gnostic mass frequency, mm -hmm. You're pulling in the power of all the thousands upon thousands of masses that have ever been done and all the tens or hundreds of thousands that will ever be done throughout all of the history of our practice. And that has, that, you can feel that in my view. You, you can, when you are in that space, when you are, when you are sensitive to that, you can, you can feel the value of plugging into that ritual energy to give you a little extra momentum, a little extra energy to use. And then of course you're contributing to it as well. And then finally, and in my view, the single best reason for doing ritual is that it seems to work. <laughs> I, I'm an engineer. I, I am far less interested in the hows than the, the, the whats. I don't care how it works, I care what works. And ritual, in my experience, and, and again, it's very frustrating because you can never run A-B tests on yourself. <laughs> you know, well, what happens if I hadn't done that prosperity ritual? Maybe, maybe I'd be twice as, as well off now. But in my experience, to the extent it is possible to self-evaluate and also look at what happens to people around me, it seems to work. It seems to get the job done. And that, that's good enough for me. All the rest of it is, again, I mentioned earlier, the kinds of conversations that are good to have after you open the, the second bottle of wine. The, the mechanism of magic, you should save for the third bottle. <laughs> That'll be a long night. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but a, but a fun one. <laughs> Next thing you know, you've got a magical duel to the death going on on your front lawn. And, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Again. <laughs> so what are some purposes of ritual? Why might we want to do ritual? Now that we've decided that it seems to work, what does it work for? What do you do with it? Well, there's a few different answers to that. Some broad categories. The, the core one, the one that, that Crowley actually called out as being the, the only one that was, was guaranteed not to stray into black magic, is personal development. Perfecting yourself, refining your own capabilities, empowering yourself, exploring the nature of your being, um, all of it focused in, in, in one version of this system on the attainment of the knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel. But there's a whole lot of, if, if you buy that, that view of things, if that's a, a good description for the path you're on, you don't immediately start going off and asking your angel for dates. There's, there's a, there's, you can. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't tend to work. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of preliminary work to be done there in, in, in basically strengthening yourself, making yourself suited for that. And that involves a whole lot of, of work with things like, you know, elemental and planetary forces, and understanding the mechanics of astral travel and all of these, these, these sort of basic pieces of the magical toolkit that you need to have strong and, and in your toolbox in order to then go after the more advanced stages. All of that is fantastic application of magical ritual. Using a ritual to tune your consciousness when you're, say, about to scry the element of earth or when 
even when you're about to undertake study in a subject that you find is extremely difficult, invoking you know the aid of, of air or mercury or the like to, to, to focus and refine your intellect is extraordinarily useful. It really works extremely well. And all of that falls into the category of personal development. I'm trying to strengthen myself. I'm trying to purify myself, perfect myself in some way. Most personal magical work, in my experience, in, in my own and the people I know, tends to fall into that category in one way or another. You can also use um, ritual to produce sort of generic energy for an individual or a group. Just to basically raise the, the general level of power available. People are often, uh, people often ask me, rather, in, in my role as a bishop of Ecclesia Nostra Catholica, whether they should have an intention, a specific intention, when they go up to communicate in the Gnostic Mass, whether that, that you know, as a magical act, whether that requires an intention. And my answer is always, we're Thelemites. We, we require very little. <laughs> um, but I think you should have, as a matter of good magical hygiene, this, this is a, a supremely focused, intention-filled magical act, so you should bring your own intention to the table. But I also say that the intention there that I advise most strongly is simply that my will may be fulfilled, that I may be filled with energy and power and, and the true current with which I can pursue my will. And then let the gods sort it out from there, what, 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 what aspect of that you most need at that moment. I, I find, I, I certainly have called my shot there where it's like, you know, that, that I may achieve this goal, that I may be prepared for blah, blah, blah. In my experience, the, the more generic, just fill me with energy. I just I, I accept all the energy I need for my great work. Put it where I need it, and it tends to go the right way. Or for a group. I mean, beyond all of its other functions, and I have a whole other talk I could do on the functions of the Gnostic Mass, which is, is quite a lot of fun, but one of its core functions is simply building group energy and cohesion. A group that, that celebrates the Mass together, or does you know full moon rituals together, or even does will over their meals together, both coheres more and works better together. They, they, they form a team. It's a team building activity, God help us. <laughs> um, and that is a perfectly legitimate use of ritual, and indeed one that you see out in the, the, you know, the wider world. You know, the, the, the ritualistic behavior of armies, standing in formation and marching in rhythm and responding to commands in a particular way and all that stuff that doesn't seem to have anything to do with fighting a war, is all ritual to build cohesion, to allow people's individual identities to become dispersed into a group identity so that they fight as a unit when the time comes. Exploration is one of my favorites which is, I just want to know more about the universe. I, 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 the universe is my toy. It's a puzzle. I like, I like taking it apart and looking at its pieces. And magical ritual is a fantastic way to explore the universe. The, the best statement of intent on, on an invocation is, I just want to know more about this thing. I'm invoking the powers of Saturn that I may come better to understand its nature and its purpose in my life so that it may be applied to my own great work. So it's closely related to the, the self-development, but with more of, an, of, of, of sort of a fishing expedition. I wonder what I'll find here. I wonder what, what this, this thing has to teach me. And if you go with that attitude, it's like, okay, here I am on your plane, elementals, wherever you might be. Tell me something. What do I need to know about the nature of Saturn? What, what don't I know that I need to know about water or whatever it might be? But one of my very earliest magical, you know, sort of explicitly woo magical experiences I was involved in a group, that same class, but a different series, where we were doing the um, Orum Solis path workings, which are really good, by the way. I highly recommend them. Uh, it's called Magical States of Consciousness is the name of the book. I have very much doubt it's still in print, but it's really quite good. And so our leader was reading this path working, and we'd been through four or five of these at this point, and we were, we were on the path of Scorpio. And so it was this watery world with all this, you know, underwater vegetation and stuff going on and kind of dark and menacing, as one would expect from Scorpio. And... Hey. <laughs> kind of. But beautiful. I mean, it's really nice underwater vegetation with, with barracudas in it. Um, <laughs> so, all at once, I got rebellious. 
it's like, you know, we were in this little tour group, you know, we were picturing all of us moving together through, and it's like, no, I don't want to move on to the next thing. So I kind of, it was the weirdest thing. I'd never done this before. I, it, it was very against character for me. Usually I'm very much, you know, follow the rules, keep with the group kind of person. But I hung back in, in my vision. I just, I stayed where I was and watched everybody else swim away. And uh, so everybody kind of disappears, and I'm left in this watery world. And all of a sudden, an undine swims up to me, just out of nowhere. It was shocking. It was like I wasn't. I wasn't like I wish I'd meet an undine. Just all of a sudden, there's an undine in front of me, looking kind of mermaidish and and holding this beautiful silver cup. And I'm just you know I, I'm maybe six months in as a magician at this point. Like, oh no, what do I do? <laughs> and so I oh what am I supposed to do now? What, oh I should ask her a question. So I say, what can you tell me about the nature of water? She hands me the cup and says, empty this cup and I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Underwater. Uh -huh, exactly. <laughs> Bing! So yeah, that, that's the kind of thing that can happen when you're exploring. <laughs> yep. And then finally, the one that everybody thinks of first is a specific result. I need a new job. You know, I, I want that girl, guy, person of other gender, whatever it might be. I want something. I want, I want to get something. There's this book that I need, there's blah, blah, blah. And, you know, that's, Goetia is the classic technique for this one. Goetia is all about getting stuff. Um, it's, it's, well, I'm a <laughs> exactly. And it works. I've had it work. It's, it's not hyper-reliable for a whole variety of reasons, but it definitely works better than I would consider likely from chance. It also carries with it all kinds of possibilities for things going awry. Uh, so... Use it with caution. Um, be careful what you wish for. Um, go read The Monkey's Paw before you do any of this kind of magic. <laughs> or watch The Simpsons episode. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So earlier, I alluded to the idea of a statement of intent. The statement of intent is, is often kind of de-emphasized when people talk about magic. But especially as Thalamic magicians, I think there's nothing more important because our whole shtick is intention. That's that's what Thalam is alleged to be all about, is that you know, we, we do everything or attempt to, attempt to approximate to the ideal of having all of our acts being intentional acts. So if you're here doing a, an explicitly hermetic ritual, the very first thing that you should be saying is, What am I doing? Why am I here? What is my goal? What is what is this for? And you can see a gorgeous example of this in the Gnostic Mass. Can anyone think of what I'm talking about? Uh, well, the creed is there, but even earlier. Oh, no, I'm sorry. No, no, just a bit later. Just a bit later. Sorry. By the power of iron, I say unto thee, arise in the name of our Lord the Son and of our Lord, that thou mayest administer the virtues unto the brethren. There's your statement of intent. That's why this this dead priest is being pulled into incarnation. He's got a job to do. We're not. You're not here to play pinochle. You're you're not here to, to to sit around debating Kabbalah. You are here to administer virtues to these people. Now get to work. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, and that's a statement of intent. And you know, there's if you if you look at ritual beyond the things like simple banishings and the like you'll always find that there is a statement of intent. So neglect not the statement of intent. It's what keeps you focused. It's what formulating a good statement of intent will often give you insight into what you're really after. So make also, sure. Also, the statement of intent is overlooked, but that's what informs the universe as to where you're going. Right, exactly. So you know, your statement of intent points you at the right door. Exactly. You know, <laughs> if you buy an externalized view of magic, a woo school of magic, here are all these servitors and elementals and things, you know, the, the, this, this light comes in the astral, hey, somebody, somebody's waking up and paying attention here, I wonder what they want. And then they just like, zod off in some random direction of the plane, it's like, well, I don't know, <laughs> nobody <laughs> finds it. Um, a statement of intent, they're like, oh wait, I can do that, and off you go. So, patterns of ritual. You know, ritual is, is extremely personal, or can be, but there are, there are some frameworks, some kind of, you know, architectures 
that are very commonly used in ritual that are worth having very a great you know having good familiarity with because very frequently you'll find when you need to develop a ritual you can plug it into one of these. There's a bunch of them. The two I'm going to talk about though. The first, purification, consecration, devotion. This one is good both for initiations and for creating magical tools. I'll talk about um, the, the initiation one um, is, is available for all to see in the, the publicly available names of a few degrees in the OTO system. Um, but I won't belabor that further, I'll leave that to your ingenium, as Curly would say. Um, but the creating a magical tool. You have a, a, an ordinary dagger that you want to make your weapon of air. Well, the very first thing you do is get rid of, magically speaking, everything on it that is not and consonant with that task. So you start in Malkuth, you, you physically clean it. You make sure it's polished and bright and all, all the dirt, everything that, that is you know not part of its nature has been pushed away. And then you banish all of the aspects of it on other planes that are not connected with that idea of air. You, you push everything that isn't it out. And then consecration is you put what it is in. You say, you put, you invoke or evoke air into it. You put airy energy into it. You do it by whatever method, and there's a million different methods, but you're saying, you are all about air. I am making you consecrated, sacred with air. So now, devotion, which is you use it for air tasks. You use it to invoke air. You use it to charge the air portion of your Enochian tablets. You, you, make, you, you use it in that goal. That is devoting it to that task, and that makes it more powerful through devotion because it is being used in that way. So that, that's one classic formula of, or sort of a, a framework, a pattern for how you can construct various rituals. And for this one and the next one, start looking at all the rituals you see and see if you can see that pattern. So, for example, in the Mass, you see the priest is purified, and then consecrated, and then devoted. There's, there's all kinds of interesting things going on there. And it's on the devotion that he then begins to do his job. Another one, and this is extraordinarily useful for working with, with, with deities, working with the kinds of things that you want to invoke into yourself which is describe the God, adore the God, be the God, speak as the God. And you can see this in places like um, Liber Israfel, for example, where it starts off with a description of the God that you're going to be working with. You know, um, if there's a wonderful one from, I don't think it's Israfel, no, it's, a, it's I'm sorry, it's Tehuti. Um, O thou, the apex of the plain, with ibis head and phoenix swans and wings of night, whose servants strain their bodies, bounding the beyond, thou in the light and in the night art one above their moving might. You're describing the deity you're working with in a very vivid way. You should be able to see this, this image in your head. You notice I was like hitting pieces of, I can see this, this beautifully vibrant figure as I, as I, as I say that. So you describe the God, and that's the first step. You then adore the God. You, you say how much you think that's a fantastic thing. That, that I, wow, so Hootie, you rock. I, I adore you in the following 15 ways. Exactly. Oh, oh Lord, you are so very, very big. We down here are so impressed. Um, <laughs> you then become the God. You, 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 you take on that nature in yourself, and then you speak as the God. And there's, again, I keep going back to the Mass, because the Mass is one of the most beautiful, compressed examples of, of 50 different good magical technologies I know of. But the second step speech of the priest is a classic example of this. Because it, it, you hit all those phases in the course of like five lines. O secret of secrets that are hidden in the being of all that lives. Not thee do we adore, for that which adoreth is also thou. Thou art that, and that am I. You hear that? It's just, it, it, normally this goes on for 
12 pages. <laughs> and in that one little bit, we've gone from describing the God to adoring the God, or saying, in this case, why we can't adore him, and then speaking as the God. I'm the God. And then the next phase is speaking as the God. We, we've adored, we've described him, adored him, become him, and now we are the God, so we state our intent. We, we say, you know, uh, speaking as to Hootie, I decree that blah, 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 whatever the outcome of your ritual is, your, you know, a rephrasing of your statement of intent. Because now you're the God. And if you've done it right, you're poofing at that point. You, know, <laughs> you, you really have mm -hmm. achieved that union with the universal will, and who's going to argue with the Hootie? It happens, right? You see that all over the place. Again, you see, that's one example in the Mass. There's a couple of others. You see it in various of our initiation rituals. You see it in other, you see it in the rites of Eleusis, all over the place. You know, again, homework from this one is, is, as you see rituals out there, as you attend them or use them yourself, look for those patterns and see what other patterns you might be able to find. So carrying ritual into life is my, my last topic. Who here is familiar with Crowley's Libra Astarte? Yes. Okay, good. Libra Astarte, for the couple of you who haven't um, seen that one, is a very short book about the, the nature of um, basically bhakti, achieving a, a sort of Eucharist with a particular god or goddess, becoming, becoming an acolyte, becoming the, the, the devoted worshiper of a god or goddess as, as, as an act of magic. As, as a way of gaining their aid or, or coming to understand them better. It is, in my way of thinking, one of the single most useful and neglected pieces of our magical toolkit. I have, I have spent most of my magical career doing this at least three or four times a year for, for periods ranging from a month to three or four months. And it is extraordinarily useful. Um, it, it, it has shown me parts of, of the universe and or myself that I never suspected that were there. So I very highly recommend it. The very best way that I know of, I talked earlier about not putting magic in a box. And this is especially important in Libra Astarte because the whole idea of Astarte is to make every moment a sacrament unto the God that you are working with. And that's not going to happen if you, you know, you have your nice little altar over in the corner and you do something in the morning and something in the evening and then forget about it the rest of the day. It ain't going to fly. You need to find a way to make literally every action that you can think of doing. Every time it occurs to you, you make this thing a sacrament to the gods. So I've, I have done, in, in the relatively recent past, um, a, a pair of these, you know, sequentially, obviously, with Mercury and with Hecate. And the very first conscious thing I tend to do in the morning is make coffee. <clears throat> you know, I stagger into the kitchen, eyes sort of open, and you know, start doing the process of putting coffee together. How do you make the act of preparing a pot of coffee a sacrament unto Mercury? Oh, to speed you up. Well, mm -hmm. it, it might go something like this. O thou, Lord of all magic, I take these the calcinated vegetable matter, <laughs> and placing them in this alembic of art, mm -hmm. I will apply the hot water which will allow the rich oil to be extracted and filtered and collected within this vessel, where that oil perfected will power me through my day of devotion to your work. Mm -hmm. That is what a mercury coffee sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> then, Fast forward four months, Hecate coffee. <laughs> With these black dead beans <laughs> ground and placed within the darkness of this cup, will I take the powers of the earth and the rushing waters and combine them with the fires of thy cauldron, and from them shall a black oil ooze forth, <laughs> which I will drink as a sacrament to you, O lady of the crossroads. <laughs> That's a kate coffee. <laughs> and I can tell you, they taste different. <laughs> yeah. the, that first sip hits you differently because they're sacraments to different gods. And, and 
that's the power. And again, if you want to psychologize it, I've, I've programmed myself, or if you want to woo it, it's different coffee, but something is different there. Experientially, subjectively, I have made Hecate coffee and Mercury coffee. And that is the first sacrament of a day. And I spend the whole rest of the day finding ways to make debugging a program or stopping by FedEx to mail something or something, everything I do, how do I make this a Mercury thing? How do I make this a Kate thing? How do I make this an Apollo thing? How do I, whatever, whatever God you're working with. And that exercise of continuously making everything you do into a sacrament has ridiculously powerful effects. I will not even attempt to explain them all. Go do it. Trust me. How do you remember that, that first thing in the morning? Oh, I, I, I never did it the same way twice. Oh, okay. It, was, it, was, it wasn't a litany. It was, right. it, was, it was like, how am I going to describe this? I'm, here I am, being Hikate. I'm, I, the, the way I look at, at the, the process of, of Astarte in particular is I am the god, god or goddess's eyes and ears and hands in the world. It's like, it's, it's how would Hikate do this? What what would what would Hikate bring to this? What would her her reactions be? What would what would how would she frame this? And then I try and do that myself. It's like I, I, I'm I let I let the god or goddess live through me, mm -hmm. and it's it's rather rather remarkable, I would say. Carrying ritual into life, I talked earlier about the idea that you need to to take magic out of the box, and also about the idea that trying to get things through magic is fraught with peril. <laughs> Combining those, if it is your magical will, if you're doing rituals to Jupiter, say, in order to improve your lifestyle and get a nicer house and whatever, a good magical act to couple with that is getting a better job or improving your wardrobe so you can be hired somewhere. <laughs> or otherwise taking practical steps to make things happen. There, there's a wonderful joke about a, an old Jewish man who's gone to synagogue his whole life. He's, he's having a difficult retirement, barely enough money. And so he starts at, at the end of, of every Sabbath. He says, God, please, could I just win the lottery? And nothing happens. And after months of this, finally he says, God, Please, can I just win the lottery? And this voice comes from the heavens. Saul, work with me. Buy a ticket. <laughs> 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 Buy a ticket. If there's no, no amount of working outside the plane of Malkuth of Isaiah is going to directly create change in it. You are the agent of change. So set up the conditions for the success of your operation. And and to this end, I always say, people ask me, what's the most effective banishing? You know, people are having, like, you know, poltergeist problems and the like. How do I banish my apartment? And I always say, clean it. Yeah. yeah. That, that's the most effective banishing I know. I'm, I'm not a very popular giver of magical advice. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to like this answer. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and to this end, I'll, I'll quote uh, Benjamin Franklin. God helps those who help themselves. Yeah. Which a lot of people think is in the Bible, which I find is. <laughs> <laughs> I think the Bible is in the Constitution. So. <laughs> so, I've laid out, I hope, a reasonably good case for why, while magic should pervade our lives, specific magical practices, hermetic practices, ritual practices, can strengthen, refine, and improve the magic that we apply to our lives. While avoiding the trap of magic in a box, we can use these to further our own development, to achieve our goals, to explore the universe, and to perfect our wills, which in the end is the task all of us are set to do. Love is the law, love under will. And once again, we've got about 15 for Q&A. So, so I discovered everything so completely. <laughs> <laughs> can you describe Astarte in particular um, and taking on those god forms of the process of theurgy, um, essentially? Mm -hmm. It is. Um, yeah. And yeah, I, I wonder, like, you gave some kind of fun, could be examples of the, but in the very practical sense of like stepping into the form of that god and what that's like. In, 
Oh, well, I mean, again, if, if you're doing it as kind of a lived experience thing, it's it, you, there are you know there are ritual components. I, I would do formal invocations of, of the god. But mostly I found, and those are helpful, they help focus you, they help set the tone, they help set the intention, etc. Mostly I found that it was simply a matter of moment to moment thinking, I am Apollo's eyes, ears, and hands. That's the phrase I use, eyes, ears, and hands. You know, it's like, I, I, what I see in here, or, or, you know, by implication the other sentences, senses, I am going to interpret through the, 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 the form of that god. You know, through that lens, and when I act, I'll act through that lens, and simply doing that habitually. You know, at first, it's a matter of of conscious thought. You have to kind of stop and go, well, what what is an Apollo way to order it in and out? You know, <laughs> <laughs> but with after after a, yeah, exactly. <laughs> after a, a week or two of that, it sort of becomes you you, you flow into it. So I I I can't say that there was. Again, when, you, when you're doing the ritual formula, particularly the one that I alluded to, where it's, you know, a, describe the god, adore the god, become the god, speak as the god, that's the one you use for Astarte as well. Sure. You know, that you, you're stepping in, and that's a great way to get a sort of an initial feel for, all right, who is this I'm working with? But where the rubber hits the road, where the real value hits, is, is all those in and out decisions where over time you sort of become used to being the god, you, you you get used to who they are and what they want from you, and it just it just sort of becomes it becomes more natural. There's the, the conscious mind can begin to get out of the way, and you just start reacting like the god. One of one of my very fir first early successes in this regard that I absolutely adored. I was doing um, Rahur Kui because you know I was a young fellow. I was like, I want to I want to be the war god. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I was walking across, a, I worked at a, a, a defense plant where the buildings were scattered out across a big outdoor areas. So I was walking through this outdoor area toward this big manufacturing building that had these like gigantic loading bay doors that I'd go in through. And I was walking along and I was like, I am huge, I am powerful. And I was feeling, I was like feeling like 20 feet tall, these gigantic strides across the campus, you know, purposeful and, and fixed in my intention. And I got to, you know, the, the building I was going to and, and stepped into the loading bay and got like three steps when I realized that I had ducked. <laughs> I had ducked. I had ducked to enter a 15-foot high door. I, I, I pulled my head down a little bit as I went through it. And I was like, yeah! <laughs> so things like that begin happening. I mean, that, that's a very simple one, but it made a big impression on me. You begin to think like the god. The god gets into you. And then, and then all the other stuff follows. What was it like being here? Revelatory, because you know the first thing she does is be scary. You know, mm -hmm. that it's, you know she's she's the dark mother. She's she's the waning moon. She's you know she she is scary. But what I wasn't prepared for is the furnace-like protective maternal love. Yeah, just she's a good. She, mm -hmm. I, I, and again she. She scared the pants off me for about a week before she <laughs> began to hint at that part of it. <laughs> but it's there, and the more I, more I was, more I worked with her, and the more I was her, the more I felt this, this just. And again, it's fiery. It's this, it's the last thing you expect from Hikate, or I did anyway, is fire, because you know the, her outer aspect is all the, the sort of dank, swampy, dark, you know, the, the Kof card. But in if you go past that, if you if you persist past that, you you hit this core of absolutely fiery, passionate, maternal, protective energy. And it's, uh, I'm getting tingles. It's, it's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, an, it's a thing. Yes? Um, while we're still talking about Astarte, just as you experience it, I think Astarte is great. Uh, remember, you have to stop. Yeah. Thank you. Usually, the first time someone does Astarte, the hardest thing is to remember to stop. That's why you set yourself your time before you begin that practice. Marlene, thank because you Because you so don't want to give that up. Thank you so much. I, I normally say that. I think I managed to drop past it in my outline. <laughs> that, so, that's just yes, important. Good recovery. Thank you. Um, see, this is why we, this teamwork's important. Yes, set a boundary. I, I suggest when you're first doing it, a month is a really good yeah. thing. It gives you long enough to soak in, but not long enough that you're going to get obsessed. Mm -hmm. Then you won't get locked up in 5150. Exactly, um, exactly. And and when the boundary is done, have a closing ritual, 
you know, say that was wonderful, and I will be working with you the rest of my life because you will. I mean, yeah. I feel like now I've got I've got Hikate on speed dial. When when, when, <laughs> when I need, need that her. energy, yeah. I can pull her in really easily now because because I forged that link. But but stop the obsession, stop the living every moment as her, and and that takes a magical act. That takes that. There, that's another good place where ritual magic is really helpful, where you you have a firm boundary close. Like, Thank you, Mother Hikate, for all you have shown me, for your assistance, and for standing by my side through the remainder of my incarnation as I call on you. You know, and then back to, to something like baseline normal. And schedule schedule some time so you can like find your way back to normal before you go anywhere else. <laughs> also, um, when we were talking about rituals, it's very important to remember, you know, to live your magic in your life, to keep it outside of the box, but the box is incredibly useful. The box gives you the structure to go farther in than you ever could during your day. The box gives you a chance to separate out aspects for particular attention that you wouldn't be able to oh, do absolutely. throughout your day. And I just wanted to say that because I like boxes. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, again, it's, 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 <laughs> the, the ritual magic, the, the box, the, the explicitly ritual magic helps you aim. It helps you build intention. It helps you build energy. It does all the things I was talking about. You know, it's a thousand and one household uses. It's just the the danger is becoming focused on the ritual to the exclusion of the application, or being focused focusing the magic there to the exclusion of living it. And I've seen both those happen so often that I, I devote most energy to warning people away from those. Mm -hmm. But it's no. It, I'm not saying that you can just free run. Mm -hmm. Bye. See you tomorrow. All right. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go play outside the box. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy. Um, I'm not saying that you can just like free run it and, and necessarily have as great success. No, the, the, the tuning and energy enhancement and all of, again, all of the things that are lined up for why do ritual magic apply in spades. I, I, I'm never going to say, oh no, just, just you know, go off and say, yeah, I'm, I'm married to Hecate now. No, it's, <laughs> it's it, you keep it, keep it constrained and planned and focused and energized through the tools of ritual magic and then hurl yourself into it. And the combination of the two is far more likely to succeed than either one in, in, in independently. All right, love is the law, love under will, thank you.